This week on the Woven Energy Podcast. When we learn shamanic technique, we don't want to be bringing our baggage with us. Amska is your door in the ball, yeah? The ball has a solid surface, but you search around on the surface and you find there's a door there. You want reality and not delusion from those exercises, then you need to practice your chalisti. It depends on what you mean by spirit world. It can be from the spirit world, but you know, you know what, we, what we mean by spirit world is quite different. But I mean, it isn't supernatural, and that's the reason why these people never actually you find it you know a little bit of science um which will help to understand shamanism's view of things chi has been discovered inside the human body for many 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 years there is no need to look for it it is a molecule called adenosine triphosphate atp in one way qigong i believe has definitely come out of shamanistic understanding of of energy like everything in every part of the world when civilization comes along there's a lot of cultural baggage gets heaped on top of that basic shamanistic understanding so here's yin and yang from a shamanistic point of view um but they have another word which is one of my absolute favorite mongol words which is Um, (laughs) If I think about energy and I think about spirit and the way that those words can be used in English, it's really not helpful. It's really confusing. And obviously, whoever came up with those two words really didn't understand shamanism. That's probably the best way to put it. When we go through each of the seven sort of levels, I hate using that term seven levels, but you know, we've got to do something, you know, because it suggests it's hierarchical and it's not. Amskar stage two if you want to call it stage two is our door into the ball of shamanism hey guys and welcome to the woven energy podcast with me joseph sykora and damon smith we are here again to talk about shamanism from the ground up Okay, so here we are, episode 16, and we're about to embark on another major stage of learning shamanism, which we have so inventively called stage two. Uh, There will be practical exercises for stage two over the next few episodes, and we're going to lay the necessary groundwork for what stage two is. Now, before we get going, I've been I've been doing a little bit of research here and there, trying to find some forums and groups that I can kind of spread this podcast around and um, get people listening. And uh, I, I can't believe the level of um, imagination and uh, just the work... The misrepresentation of shamanism uh, and everything that surrounds shamanism. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're here and you're listening to this podcast, I mean, I'm I'm so grateful, and I genuinely hope that you're getting something out of it. And you know, this is this is why we're doing this podcast to try and spread real shamanism and and get it out there. But. I don't know, you know, things like um, believing literal spirits exist and and meeting them and talking to them and and finding your spirit animal uh, without any kind of experience, finding your spirit animal all of a sudden and and kind of having conversations with it, you know. I don't know, using the terms I have faith in or I believe in and and there's no real feedback from the real world or nature. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of best to try and put that to one side and maybe rip that plaster off because... Once it's off, uh, I mean, hopefully with this podcast and together we can try and rebuild that worldview, rebuild it from the ground up based in reality and experience and uh, and not really in our in our imaginations. The last thing I want to do is offend anybody. So I think a good thing to do now is to just have a very quick recap uh, on what we've covered so far leading up to stage two and try and put it into some sort of context, especially if you're just starting out and you're new to this podcast. So... The first few episodes, especially the first episode, uh, kind of lays down the foundation of what the podcast is all about. So episode one is a great overview of what shamanism is and what it's become and why it's become like it has, uh, as well as giving a, a kind of a brief overview of the stages of learning shamanism. And it goes a little bit in depth as to what the very first stage is, which is so, so important. Um after this, there's, there's there's a lot of in-depth foundation on the various aspects of shamanism. I mean, we talk about the three realms and what they represent, you know, the, the upper world, the middle world and the lower worlds that we find in, in shamanism. We also talk about imagination and how it's the most distracting pitfall of learning shamanism, which of course is, is, is very disciplined to, to uh, put imagination to one side and allow reality in. And that takes a lot of hard work. An episode which is uh, well worth listening to is episode five which is all about the word spirit and what that really means from the perspective of reality and not faith or belief. And this is quite a good episode because it, it kind of gives an insight into how language has shaped our perceptions and and uh, what we think shamanism is about because the English language is not really a good medium to, to communicate shamanistic ideas in. Uh, and so this episode, even though it only talks about the word spirit, is great for kind of that foundation. 
And then we really move on to the must listen episodes there, which is episodes seven, eight, and nine. Now, these are really important because it was our little mini series on Chelicity, which is the very first stage of learning uh, shamanism. It's your rock. It's, it's everything that you need to make sure your shamanism is real. Uh, this is what takes the hard work to develop. It's not simple and, and learning it won't happen overnight. In fact, it's something you can continually learn right through your life and right through your your um, journey into all the stages of shamanism. So if you're new, please listen to those podcast episodes. That's episodes seven, eight, and nine. So you at least have a, a knowledgeable foundation so the next episodes can make sense to you. After that, we go a little bit into shamanism and evolution. Uh, we talk about animism which to me was uh, fascinating. Those are probably my favorite episodes. And the last few episodes have been on the concept of the miasma, which we've mentioned a few times uh, in this podcast so far, but we've explored it quite in depth in the last three episodes. That's uh, episodes 13, 14, and 15. Uh, And this is another hindrance to learning shamanism. So um, so now we're here, episode 16, stage two. Uh, let's get right into it. I'm super excited, and this is going to be mostly new stuff for me. So, Damon, I'm we are starting stage two right now at the beginning. So can you give us a little bit of an overview uh, of what you intend to cover leading up to stage two? And then in uh, broad brushstrokes, recap on what stage two actually is so our fellow shamanists know what to look forward to. If you think of shamanism as as like a ball, um and the as a shaman, the place you want to be is in the center of that ball. Um, but when you when you start off trying to learn shamanism, you're not the center of the ball. You're you're outside the ball. It doesn't have to be a ball. It could be anything. Um, it's just a metaphor. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to give any insight into shamanistic technique here. Uh, just insight into how learning shamanism works. Now that ball kind of has a solid surface. It. it it has a surface that we have to get through in order to get into the ball. Now, being in the ball is is all about it's all about energy. Um, ultimately, it's all about energy, and it's about undifferentiation. That is undifferentiation between the shaman and nature, uh, and there being no distinction between the two. So you can think of that that state, the the shamanic state. Uh, there are various flavors to that state, but in general, that shamanic state as being in the center of that ball. So how do we get to learn to be a shaman? How do we get from outside the ball to inside the ball? Well, we've already talked about chalisti and how that's important. Um, when we learn shamanic technique, we don't want to be bringing our baggage with us. So... One of the first things to say is, as you proceed through the layers, if you like, through the, you know, if you want to call it seven stages of becoming a shaman, as you proceed through those layers, very often you will come up against blocks, things that you find to be difficult. And say we're at stage, pick a pick a, a random stage, not say what it is, say we're at stage four, yeah, mm. and you're trying to progress past stage four. One of the things that our baseline bias um our baseline bias makes us tend to do is I'm try I'm at stage four. I'm trying Would to this get- be an example of the baggage that you talked about. Yeah, yeah. What what I'm saying is I'm at stage four in the process. It doesn't matter what the process is, it doesn't matter what the stage is. And I'm trying to get past that stage. And I work harder and harder and harder on that stage. And what happens to a lot of people is they find they can't get anywhere with it. It's not working. They can't get anywhere with it. They're working harder and harder. And our baseline bias thinks, I can't get past stage four, therefore I need to work harder on stage four. No. If you are super solid on stages one, two, and three, you will find stage four easy to get past. If you are not super solid on stages one, two, and three, it doesn't matter how much you work on stage four, you won't get past it. So what I'm saying is, as we progress up the chain, the the importance of chelicity does not go away. The importance of chelicity is remains there. And, and chelicity, there is no stage in the shamanistic uh, pagoda, if you like, in the shamanistic tower, mm. uh, that is more important than chelicity. Likewise, after chelicity, the second most important stage is stage two, the Amska. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna spend a bit of time, probably more than one podcast, going through Amska, uh, and going through Amska is like going from finding a door in the ball. Uh, 
Amsker is your door in the ball. Yeah, the ball has a solid surface, but you search around on the surface and you find there's a door there. Yeah. So what's inside the ball is energy, undifferentiated energy. What's outside the ball is a kind of um is a kind of um miasmatically um induced separation between energy and the shaman or between nature and the shaman, the natural world. I say should say natural energy, yeah. So um if you remember the fork in the waterfall um in Fan Quan's painting, as we go through that door, what we're trying to do is restore that fork. Um and the the start of that process um to to be able to become aware of the new wa side of the fork rather than the fu shi, shi side of the fork chalisti starts to help us with that the door into the energy is through our own bodies is through our, our own the energy the spirit within our own bodies and that spirit is not separate as we said many times as that spirit is not separate from nature but how can we come in touch so the separation in a way is not just between the surface of ourselves and the outside world it's also there's a separation within ourselves and we're trying to get past that separation we're trying to deseparate or uh, use use an action of confluence so that Nuwa and Fushi the two sides of the waterfall they are coming back and they're merging they're merging back together. How do we come to understand the energy, the natural energy that's inside our own bodies? This is what Amskar is about. Amskar is your door. We, un- we start to understand that through an, a broad understanding of the breath and the breathing and the relationship, the relationship that the breathing has to energy and energy change within the body. If you, um, if you think of the universe, um, as an enormous, tapestry of woven energy um or enormous enormous picture of woven energy um that picture as we've said is not a static one the energy changes it changes and changes and changes its form over time um and that's been true since the beginning so as we said that the the three realms as they are today they are echoes of the action of the three realms in the creation of the universe and that, that those three realms, they didn't initiate a static thing. They initiated change. And so the, the, uh, effectively changing energy is, is what shamanism is all about. Amskar is the first, is, is the doll that we use an understanding of the breath and the breathing and how that relates to the energy of the human body. That's the first thing that we use in order to open that door in the ball. The other layers are inside that ball. Yeah. The other, the next stages up the, up the pyramid, they're all inside that ball. Yeah. Can we so use the we, onion analogy? Yeah. Yeah. We can use an <laughs> onion, but the, I wouldn't like to, I don't really like the onion analogy because yeah. it, it, it's, it's a bit overplayed, it, isn't it? <laughs> I, I don't even like the ball analogy, but you have to use some kind of analogy. The, yeah. it, it suggests that they're all separate again and they're not. Um, as I said, Chilisti, is is an intrinsic part of Amskar. Yeah. Mm. As you go up the as you go up the chain, every layer below is an intrinsic part of the layer above. So Amskar is an intrinsic part of Bobichig or the Tsam. We'll go into what that is. That's stage three when we when we come onto that. Um and and Bobichig it's an it's an intrinsic part of Guruch. Um and then you know Guruch is an intrinsic part of Moduch. And, and and so on up the. Would you say all seven stages are, are one really when you get to exactly it to the, exactly yeah. and that's so we have I to said. separate it out to try and exactly exactly work and with it and understand again it. you know like we've said in, in a different context when you get up to stage seven you know when we're, when we're working on stage seven with seeing the nectar we start to we start to experience the nectar we think. Well, what on earth were we on about, you know, <laughs> so, talking about all these stages? What were we on about? But again, I come back to the point in a slightly different context this time that if you're at that stage looking back, thinking, why did we even bother? Um, what I'll tell you is you wouldn't have got to that place if you didn't have some sort of conceptualization like that on the way. Yeah. Um, so 
So to to cut a long story short, Amskar, stage two, if you want to call it stage two, is our door into the ball of shamanism. It's it's our, our way in. Our way of understanding energy, our coming to an understanding of the energy within nature, and that starts with an understanding of the energy within within a human being. Does that make some kind of sense, Joe? Yeah, it does. It does. So, um, so I guess one of the one of the things we probably um, we probably best talk about. You know, one of the things we said is a, a difficulty in learning shamanism is all about language. Yeah. Mm. So, so I'm afraid, you know, as I said, things are going to get heavy again when we go into Amskar. I'm going to drop out of English um, in terms of the the, the nouns that I'm using um, because. The uh, they're not helpful. Uh, the English language uses, as you said, this word, um, this, this catch-all word "spirit." Well, the English language also uses this catch-all word "energy." Energy, yeah. <laughs> and and in and there's 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 a certain amount of overlap. If if I think about energy, and I think about spirit, and the way that those words can be used in English, there's a, there's a certain amount of overlap between them, and it's it's, it's really. It's really not helpful. It's really confusing. And obviously, whoever came up with those two words really didn't understand shamanism. That's probably the best way to put it. So, yeah. so, but just, just to give you an idea of the way in which I'm using the word energy, uh, this isn't necessarily the only definition of energy in English, but the way I'm using it, when I, when I was in school, I think I was told something like energy is the capacity to do work or something like that. And it's measured in joules, you know? Yeah. Um, I I would rather s- if you s- define the English word, not that this is any much more particularly helpful than the other definition. I'd I'd rather define energy as the capacity to initiate change, or the com- the the capacity to change or to cause change. Um, that's a that's a better way to look at it. But but in in Mongol, uh, they have a much uh, a much um, nicer a variety. Nice, uh, yeah, a nice variety, which I think we've talked about before. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, in one way, if you think about that, the capacity to initiate change, uh, isn't that Tengar? Yeah, isn't that what Tengar does in the three realms, the 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 upper world? It's that capacity to initiate change. It's it's the capacity to based on the results of what has gone before the Tsam, to to reimagine that, or so to recreate that in a in a in a new version of the universe, in a new continual change yeah continual change and so in a way could we translate energy as tenger if we were following that kind of definition you know um but then sometimes i feel i feel energetic you know saying i feel i feel energetic i feel a buzz i feel energetic you're lively yeah yeah yeah. well you know that's that's the spirit the spirit the settel being strong inside me so again do you see what i mean there's a lot of crossover between this word energy and this word spirit um, and just that, just the the Mongols have a word for just plain kind of everyday energy, as you would use in a modern society. Um, so, for instance, in a power station, you know, the mm. energy produced by a power station, i.e., the capacity to drive a machine or something like that. The word for that is ashjim, um, mm. and that's that's a. Should I say that that's a much less wide ranging word than than the English word energy. It's 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 quite specific. It's 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 literally that raw capacity to do work and it's nothing more than that. And it doesn't have more implications than that. Yeah. Mm. Um but they have another word which is one of my famous sorry, one of my absolute favorite Mongol words, which is hooch. Um <laughs> which is just like the like the I think there's a beer or, or cider or something called hooch. I can't remember yeah, from yeah. my student days. It's just like <laughs> pronouncing the name of that drink very fast. Hooch. Yeah. Hooch. Okay, <laughs> <got it. laughs> and that is a more um uh, energetic change. Energetic change, power, um but it, it stresses the changing aspect. It, it stresses energy in use, energy that's transforming, energy that's changing. So it's not potential, if you like. It's it's live. It's it's absolute um, absolute. Um, uh, uh, the 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 thing that makes life this continual change. 
And um, so I'm going to use those two different words a lot. And I just wanted to to make clear what I mean by them because mm. um, come back again, just to review, Ashtim just means literally just energy, plain old boring energy in a in a um, in a very non spiritual way. Just the, the the capacity to do to do work, the capacity to initiate change. Yeah, just just energy. If you want to think, electricity is is kind of Ashtim. Yeah. Do you think we can? Do you think we can put a little glossary together? Yeah, yeah, terms? we should be able to. We should be able to. We'll use to the email subscribers. We'll use the, the famous "say it like you pronounce it" Romanization rather yeah. than the one that they. <laughs> I, I mean, I look special at language. How anybody, how anybody manages to pick up any Mongol with the Romanization that they use on the internet and stuff? I, I just have no idea yeah. <laughs> because you look at those letters, you have no idea how to pronounce that word. None whatsoever. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we'll, we'll use we we'll use our own. So we'll, just so if in case anybody's trying to look it up in the dictionary um maybe we can we can write some uh, mongol bichig um some some traditional mongol script as well if that i don't know if that'll help looking up in the dictionary um but maybe we could we, we'll put something together yeah yeah um that might take a little while though because writing writing mongol script on the computers is a slow process but we'll yeah. we'll have a go at least unless you unless you've got a a paid for mongol word processor which i don't yeah. um but I can do it, so we'll, we'll put something together. Um, so, a little bit of science, a little bit of science, um, which will help to understand shamanism's view of things. Um, so now we're just talking about energy. We're not. We're not talking about the energy inside the human body. We're talking we're about not- well, we're talking about both SG and so Okay, right. Let's, I want to stop using those words now, and I want to. Yeah, well, sorry, I want to use, stop using the English words. And, yeah, so we we are actually talking about both of SG and Hooch, but I'm, I'm going into science now, so so we can we can suspend the Mongol for a little while, but but it'll give a bit of background when I come to describe shamanism's view of of that energy. Um, it'll it'll help, and I hope. Uh, give a bit of uh, authenticity to shamanism's because shamanism's view of this stuff is intuitive. Yeah, it, it, it's it's come from a long way back. It's not intuitive. It's intuitive in the way of, you know, it's been learned directly from nature, i.e., directly from reality. It's not intuitive in terms of they sit around believing things. Yeah. Um. So so anyway, a little bit of science in in every cell in your body, just about. Um. There are. Little creatures. That might sound a bit creepy, but um, but they are. They're they're kind of little creatures. They're called mitochondria. Um, I think they're a bit like the Medichlorians in Star Wars or something like that. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe not. But maybe that's where the idea in Star Wars came from. The <clears throat> mitochondria, and they're, they're part of you, so they're not really little creatures. But they their structure, the way that they're formed, is very very similar to some very primitive single celled organisms that you'd find floating around in the sea, for instance. Yeah. Um, they are, if you like, a cell within a cell. So an individual human cell would have could have many mitochondria in it. Um, uh, it could have as many as two thousand. Yeah. You can think of mitochondria as one of those uh, Mongolian. Power stations, you know, clean, clean burning power stations. They are too, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they um, they they are Ashtim factories. Yeah, they they produce power, uh, and they effectively they they power the rest of the cells. So if you think like you know we we talked about putting batteries in an electronic device, um. Rather than putting say three big batteries or two big batteries in your electronic device, the cells choose to do you know could be up to 2000 tiny little batteries that go in that device mm. um now these these batteries are are rechargeable um they are rechargeable in um in two ways so that they they generally that it's more complicated than this but generally they use glucose and they use oxygen um, as their two sources of powering themselves, if you like. Um, and, um, the, the, the chemistry around, um, how mitochondria work is very, very complicated. So I'm giving you the dumbed down, super simple version. Um, there's a process called glycolysis, um, 
during the witch, um, the, the glucose is broken down into other things. And that in itself liberates a little bit of energy. Um, that, that then, the, the, the products of that then carry on. So this all happened, this, sorry, the glycolysis happens outside the mitochondria, but the next bits happen inside the mitochondria. The, the, um, the glucose breakdown reactions go around in a cycle. Um, sometimes it's called the, um, the Krebs cycle after the, the crazy guy who managed to figure it out. It is the, it is the most complicated thing you've ever seen. If you see the chemical, we used to have a, in our, our biology, one of our biology labs, we used to have a, 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 a wall chart on the wall of the enormously complex chain of reactions going around in a cycle that, that gives rise to things. So let's skip that bit, but just take it from me. It works. Yes, please. Mis- <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Kreb, who was the, the guy who, who figured all of that out. Mm. Um, uh, so it's, it's sometimes named after him and it's sometimes called the citric acid cycle because citric acid is involved in the, in the process. Um, that, that cycle, although it's enormously complex, it, it produces a little bit more energy. And now when I say a little bit of energy, we have to remember what is energy in, in terms of human cells. What, what's, what's the energy that cells use? Well, that, as I said, you know, people have been, uh, pseudoscience departments all over the world have been searching around in recent years to find out what chi is. Well, chi was found in the 19, 19- 20s, 1930s, depending on how, how you look at who, who came up with it, either the fact that it's there or exactly what it was. Uh, chi has been discovered inside the human body for many, many, many years. There is no need to look for it. It is a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Mm. Um, and it has a, um, there's, a, it, there's a, there's a, a lump on the end. That's the adenosine it and then um the, it has a chain of phosphate um modules let's call them modules energy modules yeah mm-hmm. and it exists in two states it it, it exists in as a, a two states one is the adenosine diphosphate that's with two two phosphate if you want to call them energy modules on the end and and adenosine triphosphate which has three now what happens is inside the mitochondria uh adp is turned into ATP. ATP is the thing that the rest of the cell uses to do whatever it is. If it's a nerve cell, it, it uses that as the energy to transmit its impulses. If it's a muscle cell, it uses that to contract. You know, um, actually, if it's a nerve cell, it just uses that whether it's transmitting impulses or not. There, there's a resting potential in nerve cells so that they're using energy all the time, even if you're not using them, which is quite interesting. But <laughs> it's quite interesting from a shamanism point of view. But we'll 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 get into that. Mm. Uh, on another podcast, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so what happens is you, the ATP is is offered to the cell as an energy source, and all sorts of weird and wonderful reactions go on in the cell. And anytime they need some energy, they pop one of these phosphate groups off the end of the ATP, turning it back into ATP, and energy is released. Yeah. And on on diagrams of ATP, you usually see somebody draw some little rays or flames coming out of the back of one of the phosphate. Groups as the other one pops off the end, yeah, yeah, and that that can literally be heat. It could be, you know, it it can literally be a like that kind of energy, you know. Um, uh, what and and so ATP is widely used by biological processes as it's as their main power source. That's what powers us. So, in one sense, if you're talking about energy inside the human body, at, at a very very base level, chi. The, the Chinese word that's used, um, or ki in Japanese, though, that is ATP in the human body. Uh, no need to look for it. That's what it is. So, um, the, um, this, this cycle, this comp- hugely complex cycle, as I said, that produces a little bit more ATP. Um, and then a very clever thing's happened that the mitochondria does a very, very clever thing. There are inside the mitochondria, there's an inner, me- there's an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And what it uses some of the energy, um, it uses some of the energy, um, that's produced in these early reactions, the, the, like the, the glucose breakdown, the citric acid cycle. It, it, it uses that little bit of energy to push hydrogen ions out of itself. Um, so, so basically the, there are, 
proteins in the the inner membrane that push hydrogen ions out. They're continually getting pushed out by this little bit of energy that's that's created early on. Um, there's there's another form of energy in there, but we want it's a bit more complicated than this. In fact, it's a lot more complicated than this. But just <laughs> so I apologise to any biologists listening, but I'm, I'm trying to give a, a, a dumb down <laughs> overview of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So so anyway, hi, these hydrogen ions are getting kicked out of the inner membrane, so that they're filling up the the space between the outer membrane of the mitochondrion and the inner membrane, those hydrogen ions want to get back in because, you know, whenever you have a gradient of, of any kind of a substance, so in outside the inner membrane, you've got high concentration of hydrogen ions inside because they're continually getting pulled, pushed out. You have a low concentration and, and hydrogen ions, like lots of other things, want to move from the place where there's a high concentration back into the place where there's a low concentration. But there's a membrane there that stops them moving across so easily. But what there is, is this enormously complex protein, uh, uh, a thing called uh, ATP synthase, Um if you remember, we talked about some other biological molecules in previous podcasts, and we said they were they were relatively simple. Uh, I think we were talking about neurotransmitters, right? Yeah. Um, they were relatively simple on biological standards. Well, ATP synthase isn't. This is a complicated beastie, um, and it's almost like a little factory. It 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 has moving parts. You know, it's it's a it's a complicated thing, and the hydrogen ions they can't get back into that inner membrane space like they want to. But, but what happens is the ATP synthase like offers them a tunnel to go down so they can get back in. So they start charging down the middle of this ATP synthase. As they go through it, they become the, the, the motor force for ATP synthase to turn lots more ADP into lots more ATP. So the ATP synthase is the thing that makes the vast majority of the adenosine triphosphate. And this process just goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, and um and it's um it's it's what powers us it's 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 the it's the active source of energy within our bodies the the by far the primary active source of energy within our bodies so how does that relate to to the mongol concept of ashjim and hooch well this is in a way this is the ashjim yeah Mm-hmm. This is this is the power. This is the power, the capacity to initiate change, being generated. And and you know, Mongols, modern Mongols, use the word ashjim a lot. It revolves around electricity. Well, actually, through the inner membrane, through the inner membrane of that of that um, of that um, uh, the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, electrons flow because of this this movement of hydrogen ions. Electrons flow literally flow through that membrane through different through different compounds that are in there. Um, and, um, it's called the electron transport chain. So there's literally, tr- literally electricity involved in this, a flow of electricity. So we're not talking about using electricity as a metaphor. There is a literally electricity involved in this process. So it's, it's a combination. The S gene that's, that's produced by these, um, the S gene that's produced by these mitochondria, it, it's, it's a combination of chemical and electrical energy. That's what it literally is. Um, and the electrical energy kind of drives the production chain for the chemical energy. Um, but the energy to drive that electrical energy also comes from the breakdown of, um, uh, the breakdown of, um, of the glucose, uh, and which, which we also need oxygen, oxygen for. Um, so if you think of the mitochondria, the mitochondria are the ash gene. They're, they're producing the ash gene, but the hooch, is the rest of the cell. You know, a muscle cell contracts, it does various things, or, or um, a nerve cell wants to send an impulse down its axon, or, uh, you know, the, the uh, pancreas wants to uh, secrete a hormone into the bloodstream, or, or any of those activities, that's the hooch. Yeah, that's the hooch. Mm. Um, that's ATP being used as the power source, whereas the ash gene is the... The mitochondria, um, the mitochondria producing the the uh, power in the first place, producing the the energy, the, the energy in the first place. So, uh, I apologise for the the, the pseudo scientific or semi scientific uh, diversion, but I think it's important to note that um, shamanism's view of 
energy and the modern biological understanding of energy in the body are a very close match. Um, and I would contrast that with, for instance, you know, I've, I've practiced like, like most people, um, who are interested in things I'm interested in. I've practiced a lot of Qigong in my life. And, um, I've often been asked, I think you asked me, you know, I'm on one of the podcast, something about Qigong or something about Qi. Mm-hmm. Um, that there is a reasonably close correspondence between the way that traditional Chinese energy arts view energy, reasonably close. Uh, but when we talked about, um, I think it was on the, one of the question and answer sessions and somebody asked, is, is, is there a lot of energy work in shamanism? And then they said, for yes. example, the, the macrocosmic and microcosmic orbits. Um, and yeah. I said, before you said, for example, yes, definitely, but, I had a problem with the second, and this is, this is what I'm talking about. Qigong is, is heavily influenced by Chinese culture, by Taoism, i.e. Chinese miasma and Chinese religion, which is mm. part of Chinese miasma. And so it's, my, my opinion is that Chinese, that the, the view, I don't, you know, if I didn't think there was any value in Qigong, I wouldn't practice it. I practice it a lot. Um, but the, um, the shamanistic, view of energy within the body, in my opinion, is a much closer match to current scientific understanding of energy within the body than is the understanding in in Qigong. So that's just a, now we've got enough foundation to answer that question a bit more detail. There's there's mm. a, an answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, um, what, what I'm trying to say is that your your cells are powered by loads of little internal batteries that produce ashjim, but they're also able to do things themselves. Otherwise, there'd be no point in having them, and they do all sorts of different kinds of things. And that is hooch. Yeah? Does that make some kind of sense? Yeah. Now, obviously, the this process, seeing that it's powered by... Um, uh, um, seeing that it's powered by two things, oxygen, um, which obviously we, we breathe in, we, it comes in through our lungs and, and, and gets to, uh, end up getting to the cells via the, the circular circulation, um, in the blood. Um, and, um, and glucose, which effectively comes from our diet, um, we, although it is stored, you know, it can be stored within the body in various forms. Um, that's why, you know, some of us are a little bit overweight, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the Those two things obviously influence the ashtim and hooch, the production of the ashtim within the, within the cell and the use of the ash, of the, the use of the ashtim in the form of hooch, i.e. changing energy um, outside the cell. So if you think of this in terms of um, Chinese understanding, that could be, you know, the SGM, you could view that as the chi, although that word be, would be much narrower, I think, than much narrower than the, you would trip the, the meaning of chi you would find typically in, in, in Chinese qigong circles. Mm. And the jin, the, the, the changing energy, the, the precipitated energy, you could see that as huch. So you can see that in the, in, in in one way, Qigong, I believe, has definitely come out of shamanistic understanding of of energy. Um, it it's just had a lot of like everything in every part of the world. When civilization comes along, there's a lot of cultural baggage gets heaped on top of that basic shamanistic understanding. Um, so when we when we live our lives, we um, we produce energy. A, f- a friend of ours, um, one time, um, uh, one time he was sat having his, his dinner when I was there or something. I think we were in a, like a greasy spoon or something. And somebody asked him, um, somebody asked him what he was, what he was doing eating, where he should be out practicing, you know? And he said he was developing his chi. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he was, that's a guy who has some understanding of this stuff. He's a physicist. Um, <laughs> And, um, and, um, he, he said that because he knows that, 
you know, any any kind of food he puts into his body is probably going to turn into glucose at some point, and that will be used to produce adenosine triphosphate, which is effectively chi. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so um, to to cut a long story short, that's how the process works inside the cells. Now, the question is, what relationship does the the breath? The breathing, the transport of oxygen towards the cells. Obviously, there are waste products of that process as well. The famous one is carbon dioxide. There are many others, and and transport the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, um, and the the circulation. So that's the lungs and the heart uh, and the the circulatory system, the the hemoglobin in the blood that carries the um, that carries the. Um, the oxygen to those cells so that they can do this stuff uh, and also carries the glucose to those cells so that they can do this stuff. Uh, what what does the complexity of how we breathe, how fast do we breathe, um, why do we breathe, how fast does the heart rate beat, what's the pressure of the blood in the... All of that stuff... It, it it makes it a complex system. It's and and there's a delay. You know, there's a delay. There's it's not a long delay, but there's time for the the the, the glucose. Sorry, the the energy in the form of oxygen or the energy precursor in the form of oxygen to to get from the lungs to the heart and then round the body and out to the cells. And and also this stuff is is as we said the breathing is controlled in two ways. It's, you can consciously control your breathing. You know, you can go. <laughs> Like that, that kind of thing, you can consciously control it. But most of the time, you don't think about breathing. Your your autonomic nervous system deals with that. So breathing is, is selected by shamanism because if you think about it, that conscious control, in some ways, that's like the baseline, yeah? Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the autonomic nervous system, that's like the top line. And it's a complex subject. And this is why we spend so much time on it in shamanism, the, the Amska, the breath, the broader sense of the breath. Hopefully now you get a broader sense of what I'm talking about. It's how the breath locks into and catalyzes the energy changes within the body and how they relate to the things that a shaman does or the things that any human being does as they go through their lives. But in our case, especially as they're applying their shamanistic technique. And that is our door in. That's our door into the energy, into the, the, the woven energy. So, so what we, um, what we seek to do is come to that understanding, how to the, that complex system. So the, the, the central nervous system, um, the, 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 the breathing being under conscious control, you can actually, if you, if you study it or you practice it, you can, you can also control in the same way. Your heart is under, it, it has its own pacemaker, but it's also under control of the autonomic nervous system, but you can actually take conscious control of your heart. Um, if you, if you want to see that that's true, then, um, I, I suggest you take out a huge mortgage. And then start thinking about the fact that you can't pay it back and see what that does to your heart rate. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can take conscious control of your heart rate in the same way that you can with your breathing. But we think about it with more with breathing because we do it more with breathing. So, for instance, when I dive down into the water in the swimming pool, I pretty much consciously try not to breathe in. You know? <laughs> Although there is a bit of an autonomic reaction there as well, you know. So... So this is this is what Amskar is about. It's how do those little power stations down in each and every one of your cells in your body, mm-hmm. how do they relate to your breathing and your circulation? Um and, and also in a certain extent to your digestion. I mean we talked about we talked about how if a lion jumps out of the long grass and goes for you, your autonomic nervous system will will should stop you, stop you digesting. Yeah, it just stop that for a while. But obviously, it doesn't want to permanently stop you digesting. That would be bad. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so that's the idea of. Is I'm, the I'm breath scared. relating to um, the eschim or the hooch or the eschim and the hooch together and they're interplay with each yes, other? Yes, correct, correct. Yeah. The, the, you can't have hooch without eschim. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. Um, but in a way, from a shamanistic technique point of view, the hooch, hooch 
is the, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, no, I don't say it fast enough, mate, so you definitely don't. <laughs> 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 uh, but, um, it's stub your toe or something. But basically, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, I, it, it, that's the important one, really, really. Um, and, and, but I, I like to use the Mongol word Ashjim because in Mongol, not old fashioned Mongol, but in modern Mongol, uh, Ashjim also almost uses a synonym for electricity. And I like to use that word to make the point that this, this is, it's, it's not some weird and mystical, and there's, you know, referring back to Qigong circles. It's not mystical energy. Mm. It's not weird and un- understandable weird energy that's supernatural from the spirit world. It's, well, it, it depends on what you mean by spirit world. It can be from the spirit world, but you know, you know, what we, what we mean by spirit <laughs> world is quite different. But yeah. I mean, it isn't supernatural. And that's the reason why these people never actually find it. You know, they're looking, they're defining what it is they're looking for as something well, weird, they supernatural. Think they found it. Thing. Oh, yeah, even so. Yeah, yeah, no. But the, the, but the bottom line is it's not. So if I translate qi into English, the Chinese word qi into English, I don't translate it as internal energy. I don't translate it as mystical energy. I don't translate it as, as you know, anything other than just energy. Yeah, mm. because energies are catch-all, just like spirits are catch-all. So let's just say energy. Any other words you add to that are just going to add to the confusion, not separate it. So let's let's stick with the Mongol eshjim, which is which is literal. You know, in modern Mongol that's electrical power. Well. The electron transport chain in those mitochondria, that's electrical power. You know, there is electricity involved. The flow of electrons, which is what electricity is. Yeah. Yeah. And the hooch, which is those, um, those phosphate groups popping off the end of ATP to turn it back into ADP and releasing electric, uh, le- releasing energy at the same time. Uh, that is the hooch. Um, that's the, that's the usage of ATP within the body. So that's my fairly scientific definition of the two words that I'm using. Um, and I, there's no mystical, there's no mystical involved in either one of them. Um, unless you, you know, you want to have, you know, want to understand exactly in detail what's happening with those electrons. Um, then, you know, then you're getting into quantum physics and, you know, some people might call that mysterious and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but what I'm saying is, uh, from both a shamanistic point of view and from a scientific point of view, there is strong, solid evidence that this stuff is real. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not, uh, it's real in both cases because from a scientific point of view, it's people outside the, obs- the experiment observing the results and saying on the baseline, yes, that's that. That's how that works. That's how that works. And I think Mr. P- Kreb got his Nobel Prize on the basis of that kind of thing, you know. Um, and in shamanism, exactly the same thing, but they're just not outside the experiment looking in. They're at the center of the experiment participating in it. And they've come to this understanding. Um, but effectively in the same way, both groups of people are looking at nature, just the shaman's looking at it in an undifferentiated way, whereas the scientist is looking at it in a differentiated way. Mm. Um, so, so that is ultimately the purpose of the, um, the Amskar stage in the process of making a shaman. In order to do that, you have to, ha- you have to have strong chalicity. So now that we're in inverted commas, moving on to Amskar is not the, is probably not the best way to describe it. In, think of more of it as now we're embracing Amskar as well. Yeah. That's a much better way to describe it. You, you need your chalicity or without the chalicity, any of the, we're going to start talking about probably in the next podcast, we're going to start talking about some specific exercises, specific techniques that you can apply mm. to start to come to an understanding of Amskar. Amskar being the, that broad picture that I, I described. Amskar covers the breathing, the heart, the circulation, the, the, uh, the digestion, the, the, um, the energy creation within the mitochondria, the ashtim, and the energy transformation within the cells based on adenosine triphosphate, either hooch. Yeah. Um, that, that is what we're going to do probably in the very next episode. We'll start giving some exercises for that uh, after giving a bit of background on the actual breathing itself. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, you, if you, as we've said lots of times, if you want to try derive true value from those exercises and you want to, you want reality 
and not delusion from those exercises, then you need to practice your chelicity. You absolutely have to because you will start to, the miasma will start deluding you if you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to go into all of these exercises in the higher levels of the, not just level two, all the way up to level seven. You, you have to go into them with chelicity. If you go in without chelicity, then you're, you're not going to be deriving the value you could be from them. Um, so if when we do start to, to introduce probably, as I said, next episode, start to introduce lots of AMSCO exercises, uh, which there will be a lot of, mm-hmm. um, if you're finding difficulty with them, don't naturally assume that the difficulty is the result of you not practicing your AMSCO enough. Your first assumption would be the difficulty is you haven't practiced your chelicity enough. Got it. Yeah. Which of course are episodes seven, eight and nine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, which did include exercises, and we've, as we've said, when we when we cover it, when we go through each of the seven sort of levels, oh, I hate using that term seven levels. Seven but you know, levels. We, we've got to do something, you know, because <laughs> it suggests it's hierarchical and it's not. They, they said, let's call, how about the seven embracings? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you embrace one, then you embrace <laughs> the next one as well. Um, yeah, the big, about the last one. The, what about what they call it in Teletubbies? The big hug, yeah, <laughs> big hug, yeah. That's more like it, yeah. Um, and they all hug each other, all of them, yeah. yeah. That, that's more like it's rather than the seven levels it's the big hug yeah um and um that's actually a more than i'm thinking about that's more of an appropriate metaphor than i thought it was at first, <laughs> first glance. So it's a really good one yeah so so basically yeah so so this bit of advice will probably be repeated every time we come on to something new in shamanism but you know I cannot stress enough. If, if you don't practice your chelicity, there's there's virgin on no point in practicing the Amsco exercises. Yeah, yeah. But hopefully that's laid a bit of foundation. Um, I think that's pretty much most of what I wanted to go through on this episode. So I don't know if you've got anything, Joe. Um, I just thought uh, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I kind of let you go on a roll. You've got. You just let everything out, really, this episode, haven't you? Well, you know, whenever we come to whenever we come to the process, then we're on reasonably solid yeah. ground. As I've said, the one, the one, the, there's a lot of difficulties in learning shamanism, but the one thing that is known after our two million years of learning shamanism is that we know what that process is. Thankfully, mm. Mm. it'd be interesting to go into a few more of the Chinese terms as well and kind of dissect them because we you've talked a lot about chi. There's also yin and yang. As well, yeah. uh, there's, there's the well. Let's the let's cover that off. Let's cover that off right now, okay? Again, as I said, in in qigong circles and um and the trigrams, of course, and the Jing, Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, the there's a lot of miasma. There's a lot of cultural baggage around that. So when when I describe the Chinese terms, I'm I'm giving my shamanistic understanding of those terms. Obviously, I've done martial arts since I was a little kid and I've practiced Qigong for almost an equal length of time. And, and you know, I, I know quite a bit about Taoism and various other subjects, you know. Yeah. Um, but when I'm talking about them on this podcast, I'm giving you a shamanistic view on them. I'm not giving you, teaching them as, if I was, if I was teaching a, a Qigong class, I'm not teaching them as I would teach them in that class. I'm kind of, try and explain what they are from a shamanistic point of view. So here's yin and yang from a shamanistic point of view. Um, yin and yang are, um, in, in one side, there was one way they were described as the, the sunny side of a hill and the, the shaded side of a hill. What that, what that analogy tries to do is it tries to show that they're not two different things. Um, so the, the easiest way that I describe the difference between the yin and yang, well, the easy, easiest way I can get it, ever to do it is I get somebody to push me. Um, I don't know if I've done this on YouTube, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. I just get somebody to push me and, and they go to push me and, and, um, I, I let them push me. They push me away kind of thing. Yeah. I let them push me. Yeah. Um, and then I get them to push me again and then the, the, the push doesn't move me. It stops. And it doesn't move me. And so basically, the energy, so what I said to them is, look, your energy is the same. Your energy is exactly the same. You did the same push. Um, it's your pushing energy. It's your, it's your adenosine triphosphate popping off those little, those little groups and uh, lo- those little phosphate groups becoming adenosine diphosphate, releasing energy that's letting you push me. Um, and 
But my, I experience that energy in two different ways. If I let you push me, I experience it in a yin way. If I prevent you from pushing me, I um, I experience it in a yang way. Mm. So, so energy is not separate. It's not two different energies. But my understanding of my understand, you know, I'm, I'm uh, very very interested in the Jing. I think it's a very interesting book. Um, and um, maybe we'll we'll go through all that stuff. Um, I mean, you know, there's a temptation at this point in time. Do we start going on to the talking about what the trigrams mean? Um, well, I think we have to cover the, them at some point. Um, but it, it, it will it will slow us down. It will break the floor, and we won't be doing AMSCO exercises in the next episode. That's the that's the thing that worries me. We'll do them. We'll do them afterwards then. But I think yeah, from okay. what yeah. So the first, how about do this? We we'll do some exercises for AMSCO. Yeah. And then when we go back into light light mode, we can start doing the eight trigrams. But we best we best not get onto the. Why do you exercise. want to talk about the eight trigrams though? Um, I I don't know. I I. I well, what I'm think, asking is, what do they relate to as far as... Well, they, they relate to energy change. Yeah. yeah? yeah. So, okay. so as I've said, uh, the yin and yang are two, different, are two different ways of experiencing the same energy or the same energy change, yeah? Mm. Well, really the same energy. But, but that experience can be on any, one of any of the three levels. It can, it can be in the, the creative realm, it can be in the manifest realm, it can be in the receptive realm. And and the experience can be yin or yang within any of those realms, so it's it's not absolutely essential to to learn about the trigrams, the sixty four hexagrams, to be a shaman. Shamans the world over seem to manage just fine without them, uh, <laughs> without ever having that stuff. So I I but it is relevant, but it is relevant. So what I what I would view is as, as additional information. So I, I would say I would, I would put that stuff in our, our you know once we've got through the Amsker stage. Mm. And then we go back into let's do a few lightweight ones before we move on to the onto the next stage. Mm. Um let's do that. Um and um at that point in time. So people yeah. are already people are already practicing their their legion of AMSCA exercises. They're out there practicing. And then we can talk about this stuff and maybe then it'll have a bit more meaning, a bit more context. But but if you think in terms of the eight trigrams. Any one of the energy that's involved in any one of those changes can be experienced on three different levels: the creative realm, the mid, the the, the manifest realm, and the receptive realm. Mm-hmm. And you can experience that, you know, in general terms, you can experience any one of those in a yin or a yang way. So that's where the eight trigrams came from. So back in a previous episode, when you were talking about the spirit dance, not the animals, well, both actually, the spirit dance and the animal yeah. spirit dance. The these uh, eight trigrams are representative of the energy changes which which enrich and enlighten even your dance is that well, correct well I, I wouldn't i wouldn't really it's 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 correct but the other way around right the energy changes which enrich and enliven your dance can be post analyzed using the model of the eight trigrams to gain maybe some baseline some more baseline insight into what's going on mm. uh, that's their purpose they it, it's not the eight trigrams that are given rise to your yeah, your spirit dance. Yeah, right. The the eight trigrams are a model, a human constructed model that's used to try to understand the three realms on the baseline, as we've said. Um, but but it can be informative, and it can it can make you think about range. So you know, I said sometimes there are appropriate uses of the baseline, and so understanding that stuff. Here's why I think it's valuable to a shaman. You can learn you can learn to do a good standard of spirit dance. Um. You can learn to do a very good standard spirit dance without even even hearing the words eight trigrams. Yeah, there, there's no problem with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you have a very experienced teacher, probably experienced in spirit dance, you know, if that's a, your teacher's specialism, you can potentially theoretically achieve the highest levels of spirit dance without ever hearing the word eight trigrams or even yin and yang. Yeah, mm. but. Having that understanding, having an understanding of the trigrams and the, the book of changes, which have come out of shamanistic understanding, one of the things you can use the 64 hexagrams, for instance, is, you know, we said one of the desirable things in spirit dance is to have a, 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 a complex, multifaceted radar for nature. You don't want a simple boy. So you don't, you know, if you imagine, you know, 
listening to somebody in the next room by talking through a tin can with a piece of string mm. versus you have that room covered with video cameras and, you know, yeah. high tech microphones and, and fl- vibration sensors in the floor and, you know, uh, heat detectors and all that kind of thing. From one end of spirit dance to the other is an analogy, you know, uh, listening down the tin can would be, you're doing very simple spurt dance. And at the other end, you're doing this enormously rich, complex spurt dance, which is much better read off in nature, giving you much better information. Um, when you get on with spurt dance, you may come to a point where you'll, you'll have a desire to implement more changes, more energy changes within your spurt dance. But you actually can't think of any. You've been given a lot, you know, loads, but you, you still want, you know, you want to improve your radar. The book of changes is, is very, very good for that. The 64 hexagrams are really good for making sure there aren't things that you've missed. Um, and that's the way that that's what I th- view as the, the, the authentic, um, baseline. Uh, sorry, not authentic, the, the an appropriate the ultimate. <laughs> an appropriate application of the baseline rather than inappropriate application of the baseline is just uh-huh. to act as an assist to make sure you've got all the bases covered. That's probably the best way to put it. Fantastic. Do you want to carry on a little bit with yin and yang? Because uh, no, I did interrupt I, you. I, I, my, my, no, you yeah, didn't. Exactly. <laughs> my description was done. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I could carry on, okay. but then this bit, this then becomes a podcast on Taoism. No. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, you know, I I could talk for hours on that subject. But so as far as shamanism's done, there, yeah. as far as shamanism's concerned, uh, my my definition is complete. There are two different ways of experiencing the same energy. That's enough from a shamanism point of view. Right, fantastic. So, should we leave that there then for this episode? And yeah, uh, I think so, mate. I think so. Next episode, we're gonna, as you say, we're going to have a full episode of exercises. Then I'm exercises to galore. Everybody else is too. <laughs> exercises galore. Yeah. Uh, so, one thing you can do in the meantime is listen to episode seven, eight, nine, which is on Chelicity. Um Try and keep practicing that, no matter what. And uh, and yeah, head on over to the website wovenenergy.com. Uh, you can grab a. A get started episode over there um keep in touch let me know any questions you have at joe that's joe joe at wovenenergy.com and uh, we'll see you next week thanks so much thanks a lot joe